The year is 1987, and American TV networks launch a number of short-lived shows, such as Starman, The Popcorn Kid, and Probe. In a fit of midlife nostalgia and an effort to remind the world of shows they have forgotten, lone podcast pilot Chris Cooling steps into the forgotten TV studio 30 years later. Remembered to obscure TV memories of the 70s and 80s, including short lived TV shows and made for TV movies, this is Forgotten TV. Welcome to Forgotten TV. I am your host, Chris Cooling. Remember that you can support Forgotten TV on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month and become a producer of Forgotten TV. Patreon supporters gain access to Forgotten TV Supplemental, additional podcasts that go beyond the information presented in the show. More on this during the end credits. Links for all the ways to support Forgotten TV are easily seen right here on your device, in the show notes, or at Forgotten.tv. This episode of Forgotten TV was brought to you by executive producers Will Welton and Doc Pinko. The DVD set used for review was provided by Eric Fusco. Thanks to all for your support of Forgotten TV. The 1818 novel, Frankenstein, is generally regarded as the first work of science fiction. Mary Shelley's novel sought to explore the dangers of the Industrial Revolution and human arrogance in using technology to thwart nature and tamper in a domain previously left to God. While not a robot, Frankenstein's monster was fiction's first artificial life form and paved the way for the robots that later dominated literary speculative fiction. Yes, the concept of making an artificial man from organic or inorganic materials is as old as science fiction itself. The use of the term android is traced by the Oxford English Dictionary to Ephraim Chambers' 1728 Cyclopedia in a reference to an automaton that St. Albertus Magnus allegedly created and was smashed by a startled St. Thomas with a stick. The 1886 French novel The Future Eve is credited with popularizing the term android in its depiction of Hadley, a mechanical woman run by electricity. The story The Brazen Android by William Douglas O'Connor first appeared in the Atlantic Monthly in April 1891 and featured philosopher Roger Bacon attempting to use a steam-powered brazen head to terrify King Henry into meeting Simon de Montfort's demands for greater democracy. RUR, or Rossum's Universal Robots, the 1921 play by Carol Capek, is credited with coining the term robot, which means forced labor in Czech. Its plotline has become familiar territory by now, 
in the far-off setting of the year 2000, the robots eventually view man as an inferior species and rise up out of their enslavement. You are not as strong as the robots. You are not as skillful as the robots. The robots can do everything. You only give orders. You do nothing but talk. I don't want a master. I want to be master. Decades later, none other than Isaac Asimov would coin the term for the fear of this taking place, calling it the Frankenstein Complex. RUR actually became the first science fiction television program ever broadcast. A live production in 1938 from Alexandra Palace Studios on February 11th, it aired a full 11 years before the live production of The Time Machine would broadcast from the same studio. One early iconic film representation of a robot, or Maschinenmensch, was that of Maria in the 1927 German film Metropolis by Fritz Lang. The design of Maria resides in our collective memory due to her image being used countless times in popular culture and was an obvious influence of later robotic characters such as C-3PO. From these early depictions, robots and androids have made countless appearances in fiction. Fast forwarding to later TV, what I'll call androids, robots that weren't just metal men with two arms and legs, but could at least visually pass as human, began making appearances. The Twilight Zone made several contributions to our list. From Alicia in the first season episode, The Lonely. Corey. 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 To Jenna, the android daughter in the lateness of the hour. There was the electrical grandmother in the episode I Sing the Body Electric, based on a Ray Bradbury short story. Alan Talbot in the season four episode In His Image discovered to his horror that he was an android. In the 1964 Outer Limits episode Demon with a Glass Hand, Robert Culp played Trent the futuristic android sent to the past. 1964 was also the year Julie Newmar was My Living Doll on CBS with Bob Cummings. My Living Doll made to order She is perfection in a girl Jaime the Robot started appearing on Get Smart in 1966. Star Trek was rife with androids from 1966's What Are Little Girls Made Of, to Harry Mudd's attentive female androids in 1967's I, Mud, There was Raina Capek, beautiful wife of the mysterious Flint, in 1969's Requiem for Methuselah. And who could forget Mr. Atos, the librarian, in 1969's All Our Yesterdays. Of course, I am the real Mr. Atos. The 1970s stepped up the appearances of robots and androids in both TV and film. There was the Gunslinger in 1973's Westworld, the Stepford Wives in 1975. I'll just die if I don't get this recipe. Androids made appearances on Kolchak the Night Stalker. There were robot doubles and fembots galore on the Six Million Dollar Man and the Bionic Woman. Gene Roddenberry's The Questor Tapes, Space 1999, Fi and Fum on The Lost Saucer, androids seemed everywhere in the 70s. It was in this 1970s zeitgeist that Anthony Wilson, executive producer of The Immortal, and who adapted Planet of the Apes into a TV series for CBS, wrote and produced a short TV movie pilot about a biosynthetic android joining the police force for ABC in 1976. When greenlit as a series, Alan S. Epstein, creator of the TV series Doc Elliott and producer of the TV monster movie Don't Be Afraid of the Dark, joined him and shared Created By credit for Future Cop. Well, that's what the credits say. The real story is a lot more complicated and involved a lawsuit that was finally settled in 1980 and something we'll explore more fully 
in Behind the Scenes. This is sort of an odd one. I never watched Future Cop and wasn't really aware of it when it originally aired. But you could hardly blame me. There was the original TV movie, five episodes that aired on ABC in March and April of 1977, and an attempted reboot that aired once in 1978 on NBC. The series is very similar to another 1976 ABC series that seems to be remembered by more people, called Holmes and Yo-Yo. We call him Yo-Yo. He weighs 427 pounds. He's a completely mobile computer, specially programmed for police work. Is he indestructible? We think so. Send in Holmes. In that outright comedy series, Richard Shule is police detective Holmes, and John Shuck is his android partner, Yo-Yo. That series was helmed by Get Smart producer Leonard Stern, which you will remember featured the android character Jaime in a number of episodes. Holmes and Yo-Yo played very much like Get Smart segments with Jaime. The humor is very broad, and you get a lot of situational and physical comedy resulting from Yo-Yo's robotic malfunctions or antics. While these gags worked during occasional brief segments on Get Smart, this was a bit thin to base an entire show on. The series ran for 13 episodes, and TV Guide ranked it number 33 on their list of the 50 worst TV shows of all time. But well before Holmes and Yo-Yo aired in September of 1976, Future Cop hit the air in May as a TV movie pilot produced by Paramount Television. By the time it was greenlit by Fred Silverman, it would have been the fourth robotic character on ABC, after The Six Million Dollar Man, The Bionic Woman, and Holmes and Yo-Yo. ABC Saturday Movie A world television premiere event The ABC Saturday Night Movie Tonight Ernest Borgnine and John Amos are street cops Who team up with a top secret computerized partner He's the cop of the future A future cop Part one of tonight's double feature starts now One Fox 5 pursuit on a 201. He's getting away. Hey, can you get us a chopper? You gotta be kidding, Cleaver. You really think they're gonna spring a chopper for you on a routine car theft? Aging beat cop Cleaver, with his partner of 23 years, Bundy, is again chasing a suspect in a Porsche 911 car theft ring. Cleaver is the kind of cop that can come across as lazy. He wants to take it easy, but when he's really needed, he'll spring into action to the extent he is able for his age, as he is easily winded. Now you want to know about Cleaver, huh? Well, I tell you, I've been working with him for 23 years. Now, you can't get him to jump for a drunken disorderly or a husband and wife squabble, but he's got three beyond the call of duty commendations and a medal of valor. Keeps him in a cigar box in his rooming house. Bottom line is, he's the best cop I've ever known. I wouldn't work with anyone else. But where's it written that I have to like him? Dr. Avery from the Synthertronics Corporation is giving a presentation to a group of police officials. What we are proposing to you is the policeman of the future. A robot? No, Commissioner. A functioning biosynthetic android. Haven. What does the name stand for? Nothing. Just Haven. Somehow it all seems like something out of 1984. 1984 is only eight years away. Think about it, Councilman. Will we still be using the police techniques of the 30s? One on one. That's where it's at. Watch. I'm sure this will satisfy you, Commissioner. Let me demonstrate the possibilities of Haven in a typical one-on-one -on -one street situation. In a realistic simulation, the biosynthetic android, Haven, 
is shown dealing with being taken prisoner, where he shows himself well-read in Marxist theory, as well as walking in on a misleading robbery situation. Using his sensors to realize an unlikely old woman was the armed robber, and not the stereotypical black man in hip 70s clothing. Get in. You drive, fumble butt. Of course. And slowly, very slowly, I got to rest. Of course. Partnered with seasoned cop Cleaver, who was not told of Haven's nature, it's not long before Cleaver takes lunch. But it's interrupted by a 201 call, Grand Theft Auto, and Haven starts to show his usefulness. 201 is Grand Theft Automobile. TD-28 is a traffic detail on routine patrol. 314 is a two-lane secondary road running south-southeast of the Civic Center. 911 would be the stolen vehicle. A six-cylinder Porsche with a 2,700cc displacement. Air-cooled, single overhead cams, hydraulic lifters, five-speed stick shift. Optional. Haven is able to analyze the tire tracks and follow them into a wrecking yard where the thieves are hiding. When it becomes a shootout, Haven is able to determine weapon types and count rounds of fire, which serves to his advantage. But it is revealed his service revolver had been loaded with blanks. This results in him being damaged and Cleaver discovering what Haven really is. Prototype? Haven is still an experimental model, like a special model that a car company designs without ever intending to put on the streets. Well, what do you know? That police academy must be going nuts. Yeah, well, if he's so special, how come he's such a fumble butt? Fumble? A fumble butt. An eight ball. You know, like when he goes to shoot, he can't hit the side of a barn. His gun was loaded with blanks. What? If you wanted, Haven could have been designed to be incapable of missing. If I wanted? At any range. Well, he was pretty good at tire tracks. Exactly. It's like having a mobile computer with you at all times. Ah, uh, you can stop. You can forget that computer bit. Think of it this way. For a police officer like yourself, he is the perfect adjunct, the perfect partner. Steadfast, loyal, trustworthy. Oh, it would mean so much to him. Help him. Teach him all the things that we can't. Initially rejecting the idea of working with an android, Cleaver comes to accept the notion, allowing Bundy to be promoted to tactical. A repaired Haven is able to map out the operations of the car theft ring. Heading back to the wrecking yard at night, Haven makes an incorrect conclusion. A heating stove inside a building misled his sensors. This irritates Cleaver, who tells him to stay behind while he goes to look for the stolen car. Haven overrides this command to protect Cleaver and ends up being shot several times. Back at the lab, the decision to restore Haven to his previous operating state is left up to Cleaver, who decides he will take Haven back full-time on a permanent basis. Think hard, Cleaver. I'm laying it on you. You want that clockwork joker back? You're stuck with him. Full-time. All the time. Yeah, I want him. All the time. But I want him back the way he was. Future Cop starred Ernest Borgnine as Officer Joe Cleaver, Michael Shannon as Haven, guest starring John Amos as Officer Bill Bundy, John Larch, Ronnie Claire Edwards, Herbert Nelson and James Luisi rounded out the cast. Written and produced by Anthony Wilson. Directed by Judd Taylor, an actor in his 50s, he started directing TV in the 60s with Dr. Kildare, A Man Called Shenandoah, and Star Trek. Then a huge string of TV movies and later Law & Order Special Victims Unit, before his death in 2008 at age 76.
The music theme used was composed by Billy Goldenberg. He did the music for 1971's Duel and a lot of other TV movies. The series Circle of Fear, episodes of Rhoda, The Sixth Sense, Kojak, alias Smith & Jones. He worked up to the end of the 90s. This is called Cleaver and Haven on the DVD, while the movie as aired was just Future Cop. Michael Shannon recalls being cast. It happened very quickly. I read for the director and producer, read for the network, tested on film, and started the very next day. It was all very fast, as most things are on television. The pilot was filmed in February and March of 1976. Shannon recalls it was one of the most difficult things I ever did. It was a very narrow scope emotionally to play with. The comedy came from the character's confusion in trying to understand human beings. The irony was that the android was in some ways a better example of humanity. It required a lot of technical skill, concentration, and a relentless exploration of ways to make the character interesting and versatile. Watching this today, I found it somewhat passable 1970s entertainment. I was surprised for something labeled comedy drama in many TV listings at how it was mostly a serious attempt at a police drama, just one featuring an android. It didn't attempt to be juvenile, although the subject could have easily lent itself to going in that direction. But the tonal balance of the show seemed odd. We went from criminals threatening to kill the pig outright murder a police officer, to a scene with Haven introduced to the police commissioner, mildly played as humorous. But subsequent episodes took on a typical cop show tone of the era. It does seem pretty ridiculous a police officer android wouldn't be programmed with such basic terms as cover me, but this is obviously done to lighten the situation for a family audience. Also, the producer showed restraint in the capabilities of Haven, he is depicted to have some additional strength compared to the average human, but fell short of superhuman capabilities, or $6 million man type powers. He's also not infallible and can make incorrect conclusions based on data. I'd say these were wise decisions made by the producers. Pinball fans will note the placement of a Bally Nippet pinball machine, featuring a couple of cartoon men trying to fish but being annoyed by alligators. Cleaver was not only a fan of breakfast, complete with his special coffee, but also of pinball. This aired on Saturday, May 1, 1976, the first half of a double feature that night. It was followed by the TV movie Twin Detectives. It aired against reruns of the CBS comedies The Jeffersons, Doc, and Mary Tyler Moore, and NBC airing That Darn Cat on its all-Disney Saturday night at the movies. TV Guide called it a cross between Bionic Woman and Police Story and called it the best bet for that Saturday night. In January of 1977, Future Cop began production as a series. Saturday, Ernest Borgnine and John Amos pick up a top-secret computerized partner. What have we created? The premiere of Future Cop. Episode 1. Fighting O'Haven, aired March 5, 1977, at 7 p.m. Central, opposite Emergency and Mary Tyler Moore, with a completely new theme by J.J. Johnson. Officer Bundy's favorite local boxer and personal acquaintance is found dead in the parking lot of the sports arena, and Haven deduces it's a hit and run, and similar to several recent deaths of other boxers. Seeing how he handles himself with some local street urchins, Cleaver gets the idea of Haven going undercover to infiltrate a crooked boxing ring by posing as a talented Irish boxer. A title card now reads, Created by Anthony Wilson and Alan S. Epstein. Written by Man Rubin and directed by Robert Douglas.
Rubin's first job as a writer was for the DC Comics titles Strange Adventures and Mystery in Space, edited by the legendary Julius Schwartz. Rubin wrote 14 episodes of the 50s series Tales of Tomorrow and numerous Playhouse-style drama anthologies so popular then. He later wrote episodes of Perry Mason, The Fugitive, Mission Impossible, The Mod Squad, Mannix, Lucan, and Barnaby Jones. He also taught screenwriting within the cinema and TV department at the University of Southern California for more than 10 years. Man Rubin died in 2013 at age 85. Robert Douglas, an Englishman, had been a film actor in the 1930s through the 50s and later a TV actor, appearing in One Step Beyond, 77 Sunset Strip, Thriller, Columbo, and Gene Roddenberry's The Questor Tapes. In the 60s, he also transitioned to directing, with episodes of Surfside 6, 77 Sunset Strip, Adam 12, Cannon, Shazam! on Saturday morning, and numerous 1970s cop shows. He died in 1999 at age 89. This episode introduces Captain Skaggs, played by Herbert Nelson. This character would appear on the rest of the ABC episodes. Nelson had played a different character, Klaus Meyer, the android technician, in the pilot movie. With this episode, the series takes on a very typical 1970s cop show tone and feel in the writing, music, and direction. Airing as the lead-in show on Saturday night, made this night ABC's all-cop lineup, being followed by Starsky and Hutch and Dog and Cat. And yes, the series is starting out with the boxing episode. A TV trope extremely popular at the time, The Incredible Hulk would also do this a year later as its first regular series episode. Happy Days, Hogan's Heroes, The Rockford Files, even Little House on the Prairie was not immune from this TV trope. You could tell America was flying high from the mega-hit Rocky, which had just hit theaters three months earlier. The boxing episode would usually reveal a main character was a boxing aficionado. Check. Providing a reason for characters to take part in a boxing event. Check. In the episode, Haven could not comprehend the phrase, take a dive. Michael Shannon comments on this. This was for the sake of comedy. It gave Cleaver a chance to be worried, do a double take, have to explain the facts of life, etc. In a way, it gave Cleaver an opportunity to parent the android, educate him to some extent, and consequently provided an opportunity for the relationship to develop. Shannon also recalls getting punched by his stuntman during filming. I got a black eye. There was no time to rehearse. I was put into the ring with my opponent, a stuntman, and he simply called out right or left, depending on which punch he was going to throw, and I was supposed to dodge one way or the other. This worked for a while, but then as the pace picked up, he caught me with a punch, and I had a real shiner. Stunt work has its own perils and pitfalls. The same stuntman got a concussion during filming, doing a fall into an inflated mattress from 50 feet. The character of Dr. Avery from the pilot movie did not appear in series episodes. This is likely due to the fact that Ronnie Claire Edwards had a regular role on The Waltons as Cora Beth Godsey and didn't want to commit to another series. Taking her place was Irene Sue as Dr. Kingley, who would appear in all remaining ABC episodes. Sue was born in China and immigrated to New York City with her family when she was 12. She began acting in film and TV in the 60s. Perry Mason, The Lieutenant, I Spy, The Man from UNCLE. She appeared in the films The Green Berets with John Wayne, Airport 1975, and Down and Out in Beverly Hills, among others. In more recent years, she has been a successful realtor and teaches yoga classes. Three weeks later, Episode 2, The Mad, Mad Bomber, aired Friday, March 25, 1977. You're going to set the charge at 5 p.m., right? Right. Yeah, and I tell you, this isn't the only thing that's going to blow. Uh, what do you mean? Some cops, too. 
Uh, one cop, anyway. They're gonna have to scrape him up with a spoon. Freeze! And we get a special opening segment for this Friday night movie presentation. Remaining ABC episodes retain this narrated opening with an abbreviated musical theme. My name is Joe Cleaver. For 14 years, I've been partnered with the man on my left here, Bill Bundy. We never had a secret from each other until now. This good-looking kid on my right, a rookie cop called Haven, he's the secret. He looks human, talks and acts human, but he's not. He's an android, a robot, the perfect cop. The cop of the future, a future cop. Ta-da! Uh, there is a 61% probability, therefore, the location is Santa Monica Municipal. How could he know all of that? Man, that's the fastest white boy I've ever seen. Yeah, I know. <laughs> A special ABC Friday Night Movie presentation. Oblivious to the fact that a bomber has placed a bomb right in the police locker room, the guys go out on patrol, and Haven quickly spots a petty TV ripoff operation in progress. It turns out the thieves ripped off the bomber, and one of the TV boxes had a bomb timer hidden inside. The bomb turns out to be only a smoke bomb, a warning to free a prisoner named Inez, the bomber's girlfriend. Haven quickly connects the bomb incident with a crooked businessman who knows Inez is really dead and has a completely different objective for engaging the bomber's services. The bomber is intelligent, though, and actually deduces Haven's nature, breaks into synthetronics, and places a bomb detonator on the android. With Haven removed from duty due to a false deduction, it's up to Cleaver to go off book and take Haven undercover as a Navy officer to solve the case, unknowingly with a bomb detonator placed inside him. This was written by Ken Kolb and Harold Livingston, based on a story by Kolb. Kolb wrote for series like Have Gun Will Travel, Dragnet, and The Wild Wild West. You might recognize Livingston's name. He wrote three Future Cop episodes, an episode of The Fantastic Journey, as well as the screenplay for Star Trek The Motion Picture. Livingston was the executive story editor for Future Cop. Directed by Ted Post, the prolific director did Wagon Train, 56 episodes of Gunsmoke, 24 episodes of Rawhide, 4 episodes of The Twilight Zone, as well as the films Hang 'em High, Beneath the Planet of the Apes, the crazy 1973 film The Baby, The Harad Experiment, and Magnum Force. Ted Post died in 2013 at age 95. Garrett Graham played the bomber. We saw him in 1975's Strange New World. He was also in the films Demon Seed, Pretty Baby, Terror Vision, and Child's Play 2. We'll see him again on WizKids. Harry Gardino, a prolific TV and film actor known for brash, tough guy roles, also guest starred. He played Barabbas in 1961's King of Kings, and Harry Callahan's boss in Dirty Harry and The Enforcer. Here, Haven shows himself capable of facial recognition technology, a biometric we now use on our laptops and phones, but work on automated face recognition began in the mid-60s, funded by an unnamed intelligence agency. In the 90s, systems developed had improved to the point where software was sold to companies like banks and airports. By 2002, systems used were 100 times more accurate than those of 1995. This episode revealed Haven has areas of knowledge he's not programmed with. When he read the Naval Training Manual, the parts on sexual orientation registered as not applicable. Two weeks later, Episode 3, Girl on the Ledge, aired now on Thursday, April 7, 1977. 
I sure took you a good time getting here. Good morning. It was my fault, sir. I wasn't quite ready when Officer Cleaver called for me. Heavy day last night, huh, kid? Uh, the storm this morning apparently caused a brief power failure in my quarters, which inhibited immediate activation. Couldn't you just say your alarm clock didn't go off? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my alarm clock didn't go off. Check it and see if there's a phone listed there, would you? Then what are they doing? I didn't know they were up there. Now. You, you lied to me. You're just like everybody else. You're a liar. A power surge causes Haven to wake up late and barely makes it to morning breakfast with Cleaver and Bundy. Meanwhile, a distraught young woman checks into a cheap motel on the 10th floor, ostensibly with the intention of ending her life. The trio springs into action, and Bundy begins the attempt to talk her down. Tracking down her mother takes Cleaver and Haven to a local sleazy dance bar, and it turns out the situation is more than meets the eye, and simply a ruse to bring her father, a criminal preparing to testify, out into the open so he can be killed. This is the second and final episode written by Man Rubin, and the director was Earl Bellamy. Bellamy had directed TV since 1954, and his work reads like a laundry list of classic TV. In the 70s and 80s, he worked on My Three Sons, Medical Center, Starsky and Hutch, Fantasy Island, Heart to Heart, and Trapper John, M.D. Bellamy died in 2003 at age 86. Catherine Cannon was the girl on the ledge. She was in a lot of TV of the 70s and 80s. Barnaby Jones, Baba Black Sheep, Chips, Father Murphy, Matlock, and the 1987 movie The Hidden. She has been married to actor Dean Butler, Almanzo, from Little House on the Prairie, since 2002. Episode 4, Carlisle Girl, aired April 22, 1977. Back on Friday. The opening scenes contain enough exposition to bring new viewers up to speed. Going on patrol, the trio immediately stumbles upon a heist at Carlisle Girl Cosmetics. While Cleaver and Haven apprehend one of the thieves, Bundy enters the warehouse to see if there's another and finds a man in the office who pulls a gun on him. It turns out the man is Herb Conroy, the owner who employs Bundy's daughter, and he squeezes Bundy to get the charge against him dropped. Conroy is using his legitimate business to smuggle drugs internationally. The guys have Haven go undercover again, and we get to see Haven's Humphrey Bogart impression. This was written by Harold Livingston, writing his second Future Cop episode, and directed by Vincent McAviti. From The Lieutenant to Star Trek, the Kathy Lee Crosby Wonder Woman TV movie, Gunsmoke, Simon & Simon, McAviti had a 45-year career in the business before his death in 2018. This episode guest stars were Peter Donnett as Herb Conroy, a well-recognized actor seen in a lot of 70s and 80s TV like Rich Man, Poor Man, Dallas, and Flamingo Road. Later, he played Bill Mulder, Fox Mulder's father, on The X-Files. Donnett died last year at age 90. Sherry North, Kim Hamilton, and Tracy Reed rounded out the guest cast. I started to notice the very familiar 1970s music library cues in this episode. They had been there before, but seemed more noticeable here. These were often pulled and used as background music, instead of composing original music for every scene requiring it. Music library cues also performed another important function in television. They tapped into the audience's collective memory and created a comfortable, familiar background for episodic TV of similar genres. This is the last episode featuring music by the late J.J. Johnson. Johnson did the music for some episodes of Barefoot in the Park, The Six Million Dollar Man, Buck Rogers in the 25th Century, and The New Mike Hammer. He composed the second jazzier theme for Lucan, used in the final ten episodes, as well as music for the movies Shaft, Cleopatra Jones, and Willie Dynamite, and of course, the familiar series theme for Future Cop. We saw Haven placed in a romantic situation in this episode, which threatened to become an adult situation before Cleaver pulled him out of the undercover op, and consistent with the information we were given two episodes ago, Haven displays very limited knowledge of sexual matters. 
Episode 5, The Kansas City Kid, aired April 30th, 1977, as the series comes full circle and returns to Saturday night. Then, the cop of the future impersonates a card shark to set up a poker ring. Call. Cool. Future cop, right after Blansky's Beauties, Fish, and Starsky and Hutch. Saturday, starting at 8, 7 Central and Mountain on ABC. A quite grumpy cleaver walks out on breakfast, leaving Bundy and Haven to wonder what is up with him. It turns out the money from the Benevolent Police Fund has been lost, gambled away by family friend Tom Geary in charge of managing the investment. Cleaver, as treasurer, covers up the missing funds while Tom tries to get them back from a crooked card shark, but has an attempt made on his life. To recover the missing funds, I think you know where this is going. Haven and the guys go undercover to get in an all-night high-stakes poker game to get the money back, with Haven using his mathematical skills. Haven and Cleaver have to improvise. When they learn, the game is crooked, with Cleaver's personal life savings at stake. Written by Harold Livingston and directed by Robert Douglas. Guest starring Joan Collins. Collins was a film actress in the 50s and by the 70s had become a frequent TV guest star. Her popularity soared when she was cast as Alexis Carrington in 1981 on the mega-hit Dynasty. Joshua Bryant and Don Reed filled out the guest cast. We've seen Haven's Bogart, now we see his Brando as he channels Sky Masterson from Guys and Dolls with a little of the Cincinnati Kid thrown in. A well-done, surprisingly fun episode, made more entertaining with the involvement of Joan Collins. Michael Shannon recalls working with her. Joan was very sleek and a lot of fun. Great costumes, atmosphere, drinks I couldn't drink as the android, good stuff. Michael comments on his various impressions and roles Haven took on over the few episodes we've seen. I did the gambler with a Damon Runyon accent. I did the boxer. I did a Bogart-type lover with Sherry North. The series had to move in this direction. As it did, it became more of a gimmick show. But the original idea had some mystery and subtle humor. I felt it brought something original to it. However, it was difficult to sustain as a series, especially for the writers. Indeed, this was the final episode of the ABC run of the series proper. With ABC not ordering any more episodes from Paramount, NBC expressed interest in Future Cop and picked up the series, as it had done with The Bionic Woman. The concept was slightly retooled and would return 11 months later as Cops and Robin, erroneously titled The Cops and Robin in nearly every TV listing and even network promos. Marge Lauren is the only eyewitness in the state's case against Wayne Dutton. The world's first robot policeman is teamed with a down-to-earth human partner to protect a winsome five-year-old from a ruthless killer. The Cops and Robins, starring Ernest Borgnine, Michael Shannon, and John Amos. Tuesday at 8, 7 Central and Mountain, then spying for Uncle Sam. Cops and Robin, aired on NBC Tuesday, March 28, 1978, in the first two hours of programming as The Big Event against Happy Days, Laverne and Shirley, Three's Company, and Soap on ABC, Sam, Shields and Yarnell, and a one-hour All in the Family aired on CBS. NBC re-ran the show in September that year on the late-night movie. Visiting Synthetronics, Cleaver is encouraged by the new Dr. Alcott to take Haven in as a roommate. For the first time, we get a real glimpse of Cleaver's home life. And Haven, now programmed for domestic life, is able to get the Cleaver apartment running in top shape. The promoted Sergeant Bundy calls a lunch meeting with Cleaver and Haven. In an effort to protect the wife and daughter of a former partner of Cleaver, he and Haven take on the care of young Robin at a safe house. During lulls in the action, Haven is able to explore existential human questions and concepts such as God, humor, and emotion. When the safe house is compromised, we get what amounts to an incredible 15-minute commercial for Knott's Berry Farm. One of the rides causes Haven to malfunction, 
around the time the bad guys show up to abduct Robin. It's up to the old trio, but with a damaged haven, to track the kidnappers and rescue Robin in time for her mother to testify against the man that gunned down her husband. Teleplay by Brad Ratnitz and John Anthony Mulhall, based on a story by Mulhall. A duplicate entry on IMDb for this one-time TV movie airing inexplicably adds John T. Dugan and someone named Dawning Forsyth as a third and fourth writing credit, but these names do not appear on the opening or closing credits of the movie. Mulhall has one other writing credit for Flamingo Road, and Radnitz wrote for Gilligan's Island, The Brady Bunch, Super Train, and MacGyver. Alan Reisner directed, his credits go back to the 50s with The Twilight Zone, and worked on Hawaii Five-0, Black's Magic, Sidekicks, the Gil Gerard series, and Murder, She Wrote. He died in 2004 at age 80. Guest stars Terry Kaiser, yes, Bernie from Weekend at Bernie's, played the bad guy in this one. Irene Tzu as Dr. Tingley did not return. Instead, we got Carol Lindley as the new Dr. Alcott. She was on a good number of shows from the 60s to the 80s, including The Immortal, The Night Stalker TV Movie, The Magician, The Love Boat, Heart to Heart, and was a regular guest on Fantasy Island. Young Natasha Ryan was Robin. Getting started at age two in commercials, the young actress was also in Sybil, Del Vecchio, Kingdom of the Spiders, Days of Our Lives, The Amityville Horror, and The Entity. Philip Albert, Richard Bright, Jeff David, and if you watch or listen closely, you'll recognize Ketty Lester, who played Hester Sue on 40 episodes of Little House on the Prairie, all rounded out the cast. This entry was extremely, almost laughingly padded, as if they were short the number of script pages to fill the one hour and 38 minute runtime. At 45 minutes in, I thought it was incredible there was another 53 minutes to go. I'm well aware TV of the 70s had completely different pacing and sensibilities, but establishing shots would go on for several seconds longer than they needed to be. There were repetitive scenes. They went on ride after ride after ride at Knott's Berry Farm. It is beyond clear they were padding for time, and that Knott's Berry Farm had to have paid for some of the production or at least gave them a free shooting location. We get a first name for Haven, John, and a glimpse of Haven in domestic life. In light of the comparable content on 70s TV featuring androids, Future Cop isn't terrible. Even though it was a 70s cop show, it attempted to touch on subjects later dealt with on Star Trek The Next Generation or AMC's Humans, but was limited by the series format. Due to the time allotment and a different storyline direction, we got more of these scenes in this final airing, Cops and Robin, where Haven explores existential concepts. That probably sounds familiar to any watcher of Star Trek The Next Generation. According to executive producer Gary Damsker, this entry was an attempt to make Haven more humanistic and appeal more to family viewers. We now have a kind of family-type police show with an android. As far as the title, Cops and Robin, you have to wonder what the producers were thinking. Using essentially an episode title with a clear play on words that worked for this particular TV movie, there was no indication the Robin character would have continued as the storyline resolved. What title would they have gone with if NBC continued with it as a series or as recurring TV movies? The limited information available for this series left this question unanswered. Future Cop will return after these messages.
Wonder Woman, a secret formula that makes rubber as tough as steel, brings dangerous visitors from beneath the ocean. The Nazis are after Formula 407. We must keep it out of the Americans' hands at all costs. An army of spies challenge Wonder Woman to a little game for big stakes. It's a perilous mission for Steve, and possibly the last mission. I will not fail. For Wonder Woman... Wednesday, a mad scientist programs a computer to kill. The doomsday device is controlled by Alex. On the bionic woman. Then, Beretta's on the case of a millionaire dope dealer. A piece of paper is worth half a million dollars. Oh, when it hurts me. And. It's our and our time. You know, rest, rehabilitation. Charlie's Angels take a vacation that isn't all fun and games. Right after the bionic woman and Beretta. That's Wednesday, starting at 8, 7 Central and Mountain on ABC. Behind the Scenes. Much of the premise and appeal of Future Cop had to do with the charisma, personality, and chemistry of the lead actors. Michael Shannon was Haven, the Future Cop. At the time, the Vietnam veteran was a relatively unknown actor who had appeared in a couple of TV miniseries and soap operas. Prior to that, he had appeared on Broadway in the play Butterflies Are Free with Gloria Swanson. Shannon was excited for his first series role. Locations were difficult, but the days were very long. Often we'd work 16-hour days. I recall it as a real whirlwind. Borgnine was very committed to the show, and he certainly was involved in the final casting decision. I tested with him, as did several others. Ernie was totally professional, loved the crew, full of beans, and a lot of fun. He created a good atmosphere on the set. Amos was friendly, but I didn't have many scenes with him. Ernest Borgnine was street cop Joe Cleaver. He had won an Oscar in 1955 for his performance as Marty and, in the 1960s, started working in TV. One of his most well-known roles was that of Lieutenant Commander Quentin McHale in the 60s TV series McHale's Navy. Although he continued to work in film, when Future Cop went to series, he was happy taking a regular role. I'm one actor who loves doing a series. Last year I made features and television movies, so I spend only two months at home. That's not enough. Doing a series means going to work every day and coming home every night. I spent four years in my first series, McHale's Navy, and I hope this new one runs ten years. I've done enough traveling to last me a lifetime. It's terrific to sleep in my own bed at night. After Future Cop, Borgnine worked on the film Convoy with Chris Christopherson and Sam Peckinpah. I go right from one thing to the other without missing a beat. Hell, it doesn't matter whether it's television or movies. It's all acting. As long as I'm working at my craft, that's all that matters. Some actors put down episodic TV because they think they get overexposed. People have asked why I decided to accept a cop show when there are so many of them on the air to begin with. This is no ordinary cop series. I'd have turned it down if it had been just another run-of-the-mill action show. I've played policemen in movies, Law and Disorder, and Pay or Die. So I'm back in uniform again. The network is thinking about making me a detective next season if the show is renewed. I play an old-timer on the force with a new young partner who happens to be an android. That's a computer. It's nothing like a bionic man. And we can't be compared to Holmes and Yo-Yo, the comedy series about a robot detective that bombed. We combine humor and drama. As far as I'm concerned, it's the most different cop show on the air. We're having difficulty getting scripts because the writers are unfamiliar with the concept of an android. Most script writers are locked into comedy or drama. They get confused when we ask them to combine both elements in their stories. They have to see a couple of our shows before they understand what we're trying to do. The writers are also asked to cut down violence. It's much better to solve plot problems with other factors than violence. 
That's another difficult thing for them to understand. But it's possible to go too far in the other direction, too. It's gotten so if we draw a gun, it's considered an act of violence. But isn't that what a cop's supposed to do? John Amos was Cleaver's partner, Officer Bill Bundy. John Amos took the role in Future Cop after his emotionally taxing role on Roots. The money was good, and you know, this business is feast and famine. I knew I wasn't going to get another Roots right away, so I said, damn right. I needed something to help erase the scar tissue from Kunta Kinte. During production, Amos had a medical issue that could have turned out to be a close call if it weren't for attentive studio medic Jerry Girth. He noticed Amos had a ruptured blood vessel in his eye. I checked his blood pressure and later recommended that he see a doctor. Well, he tried calling his own doctor and couldn't get him. So the unit manager talked to him and got him into Presbyterian Hospital, where they put him in intensive care right away. One key person critical to behind-the-scenes operations was executive story editor Harold Livingston, mentioned earlier. you recall he was the screenwriter of Star Trek The Motion Picture. As a writer, he sought out stories of interest, humor, humanity, and suspense. The humanity aspect, I think, was vital. Haven was more human at times than the humans. Livingston recalls Future Cop as being one of the few shows that I ever truly enjoyed working and writing on. It was also a challenge. I was very adamant about retaining credibility, so you really couldn't get too broad or you would have tipped over into farce. We had to be very careful about that. In that regard, I know we succeeded. A short-lived TV show with seven total airings. Future Cop seems like a footnote in 1970s TV. Sure, it bridged networks and had a single attempt to revive the concept. But the constant night-hopping airings spread out over nearly two years, you'd be forgiven for not remembering it. What was the deal with all the night-hopping anyway? It turns out ABC only ordered a total of six segments, as they called them, from Paramount Television, and they intended to air them on different nights, more as an irregular filler than regular series, late in the 1976-77 to 77 season. If it had been successful, a full season would have been ordered for the 1977 fall TV season. The most interesting thing about Future Cop is the story behind its creation, a story which began in the late 1960s. Science fiction writers Harlan Ellison and Ben Bova were collaborating on short stories for Analog Magazine. They penned a tale of police officer Mike Polchik being assigned to work with an experimental robot named Brillo and was instructed to take it out for a single night baptism of fire, walking the beat in a future Manhattan. Brillo's textbook interpretation and enforcement of the law clashed with the streetwise way the police had to interact with the real world. The experiment was called a failure, and Brillo was rejected by the department as being too rigid and inflexible for practical application. This story was published in Analog Magazine in 1970, and a few years later, in 1973, ABC expressed interest in developing the story for TV and a potential series, and even requested a spec script from the two authors. After reading it, they wanted to make some changes. The robot needed to be human-looking, an android, and they wanted to change the setting to that of present-day Los Angeles, no doubt to greatly reduce costs and streamline production. Ellison and Bova flat-out refused to work with these changes. Neither party would budge, and ABC passed on the script. The next year, in 1974, Ellison took the script to Terry Keegan, VP of Development at NBC. In 1975, Keegan left NBC to join Paramount Television as VP of Creative Affairs, and Keegan took the script with him. How much Ellison and Bova were in the loop on the script being taken to Paramount is murky. At any rate, the writers were unaware their script was being developed into a TV movie. Here's the way it's expressed by Billy Ingram in his book, TV Party. 
Brillo, which was written for ABC, was shown to an NBC executive. That guy then went over to Paramount and put together the Future Cop project and sold it back to the same guys at ABC who rejected Brillo. Ben Bova tells it from his perspective. They dropped the show. They said they weren't going to do it. And then we heard about a year later that a show called Future Cop was coming out, starring Ernest Borgnine, whom we had suggested as the lead for the Brillo teleplay, dealing with a pair of policemen, one human and one machine. The only difference we could discern in seeing the show was that instead of a robot that looks like a machine, they had decided to use an actor and have him pretend to be a robot. This was a point of argument. We wanted to be faithful to the original story and wanted the machine to look like a machine. Sort of like R2-D2, although this was before Star Wars. We wanted it to be a robot that looked like an animated fire plug. We argued about that. I always thought that was the major reason why they dropped the show. Immediately following the initial broadcast of the pilot movie in 1976, writers Harlan Ellison and Ben Bova started getting phone calls from friends across the country familiar with the Brillo story, but noticed neither author's name appearing in the credits. As Bova tells it, It was our script. I saw a videotape of what ABC had aired, and Harlan did too, of course. I realized they had used the script we had written, virtually word for word. There were only minor changes. It was the most blatant case of plagiarism I have ever seen. The writing team filed suit against ABC and Paramount. The case took four years to get to court. According to Bova, the defendant's defense was essentially, Yes, we stole it. So what? Everybody steals everything in this business. They thought they could get away with it because up until that time, no writer had successfully sued a major Hollywood studio for plagiarism. Thousands of such suits have been pursued in Hollywood for many years, and the studios always won. In this case, they were so incredibly guilty that I just told Harlan and our lawyer, just get this case in front of a jury, let them see the videotape of Future Cop, let them read our script for Brillo, and then they'll find the defendants guilty. Which is exactly what happened. The defense's case fell apart, and after a month-long trial, a jury decided in favor of the authors. ABC, Paramount, and a former Paramount executive were ordered to pay over $337,000 in damages to the writing team, the largest punitive award in a plagiarism lawsuit up to that point in American legal history. In a 1980 Starlog magazine interview, Harlan Ellison said, We won. And we didn't just win with some piddling amount where they could say, Well, you know, the jury was in doubt. It's a big, big judgment, and it's rocking the entire town. I'm going to have a billboard on Sunset Boulevard that will say, I caught them with their hands in my pocket. Writers, fight back. He wasn't kidding. Ellison indeed used his winnings to put up that billboard across from Paramount Pictures, which read, Writers, don't let them steal from you. Keep their hands out of your pockets. Anyone familiar with Mr. Ellison knows this wasn't the first or last time he had confrontations with the TV and film industry. Some context on Future Cop making the jump to NBC, brief as that attempt was. Future Cop had been picked up for its limited run by ABC executive Fred Silverman. He was also the one responsible for giving Jamie Summers the boot on The Bionic Woman at the end of the 1976-77 TV season allowing NBC to pick up that show for its final season. Notorious for pursuing desired demographics, Silverman had quipped, her batteries are running out. NBC jumped at the chance to pick up The Bionic Woman under President Herb Schlosser. Although it ran another full season, ratings were not spectacular, and the show was canceled again. Unknown to him at the time, Herb Schlosser had also entered his final year at NBC and was replaced with none other than Fred Silverman. The NBC attempt to restart the show likely had to do with their pursuit at the time of programs with less violence. True, Future Cop was a cop show. Note that they didn't use that title, however, but one with very limited violence 
and a concept that could appeal to family audiences. Just note the tonal differences of the original ABC pilot to the much softer approach with a little girl central character in Cops and Robin. NBC's network direction that year seemed to be that all its new shows contained little to no violence. New shows like Grizzly Adams, James at 15, Mulligan Stew, lighter sci-fi fare such as Man from Atlantis and Quark, even Chips, where the officers never seemed to draw their service weapons. There was a reason behind this. TV violence had been in the news again the prior year, with companies like Samsonite pulling advertising dollars from shows deemed to be violent, and other companies threatening to follow suit. Ad agencies were admitting many viewers were beginning to turn off violent programs. Having been critical of NBC's Macmillan and Wife, Columbo, and The Rockford Files, Schlosser himself responded to the self-appointed watchdog group National Citizens Committee for Broadcasting, saying, The mere counting of violent incidents in a program without regard to the context does not provide a meaningful measure of their significance or effect on viewers. Even so, over the summer of 1977, groups like the PTA organized to monitor TV violence in the upcoming season and threatened to boycott TV programs and their sponsors. And since NBC had been named the most violent network by the TV watchdogs, that network was number one in their sights, a position NBC was not unaware of. Jerome Stanley, VP of NBC's Broadcast Standards Department, said, We have certainly been not unaware of the various groups which have been complaining about violence on television and we have reacted to the extent that we have been examining the area much more carefully than before. Indeed, Ba Ba Black Sheep, Policewoman, Macmillan and Wife would all see their last seasons that year. Due to its very limited run, Future Cop disappeared from TV and was not seen for 15 years until the Sci-Fi Channel reran it as part of their series collection in 1993. After that, it was a television footnote with no packaged media release until Mill Creek Entertainment released it to DVD in 2016. There's a story behind how this relatively obscure show came to get a legitimate DVD release, and you can hear that on the supplemental episode that complements this podcast. Stay tuned during the closing credits for more on that. Today, Future Cop is easily found in digital form on Apple iTunes, Amazon Video, and YouTube. Ernest Borgnine continued to regularly act in film and TV for decades. 1979's The Black Hole, Escape from New York. The next TV role he was known for was that of Dominic Santini on 55 episodes of Airwolf. After that, Numerous one-off TV appearances. In 1995, he had a regular role on The Single Guy, and later did quite a bit of voice acting, including the voice of Mermaid Man on SpongeBob SquarePants. He died in 2012 at age 95. Michael Shannon appeared on Wonder Woman, Charlie's Angels, Simon & Simon, The A-Team, and had a couple more stints as the lead on short-lived series, again as a cop in 1981's Riker on CBS, and as an Air Force major in the 1982 period drama We'll Meet Again on Britain's ITV network. He had supporting roles on a number of British TV miniseries, as well as the films Superman II and Sheena. Now 76, he also has done quite a bit of voice acting and voiceover work, and currently divides his time between London and Los Angeles. John Amos, probably best known for his performances on Good Times and Roots, continued to appear in TV and film, and had regular or recurring roles on Hunter, 704 Hauser, In the House, The District, All About the Andersons, The West Wing, and Two and a Half Men. Currently 79, He lives in New Jersey and is now a great-grandfather. What happened to the credited creators of the series? 
Future Cop ended up being Anthony Wilson's last project, before his untimely death in 1978 at age 51. He was posthumously credited as writer and executive producer of the 1981 NBC TV movie, Computer Side. Alan S. Epstein went on to produce a string of TV movies, including the infamous 1981 Fallen Angel, 1988's Shattered Innocence with Otherworld's John Lee, Stephen King's It from 1990, and 1997's Breaking the Surface, the Greg Luganis story. He died in 2001 at age 59. Over the years, the concept of robot or android police reappeared time and again. NBC would revisit the concept in 1992's Man and Machine. It didn't fare much better than Future Cop with its nine episodes. In 2013's Almost Human, Carl Urban is partnered with DRN model police synthetic Dorian, played by Michael Ely. Fox TV gave that one 13 episodes before pulling the plug. What of these other depictions of a human policeman partnered with a robotic cop? Ben Bova tells us, Not every show that has a human cop and a robot partner is a ripoff of Brillo. What we were trying to do with the story that we wrote was to contrast what people say they want from the law with what they really want. Everybody says they want absolutely impartial and utterly certain enforcement of the law. If somebody is parked over time, they want that car to get a ticket. But if it's their car, then they want the law to bend. So people want strong law enforcement for everyone except themselves. And that's what Brillo was all about. The human cop understood the system and could bend when it was necessary. But the robot knew only the law and interactions thereof. That was the point of Brillo, and that's something that television is not deep enough to understand or even attempt to do. What direction would Future Cop have taken if it continued? Michael Shannon. Haven could have been continuously updated, and so could have continued to express new technology, newer insights, especially with genetic engineering moving closer and closer to creating life itself. The silicon chip has enabled science to reduce the mechanics. In terms of the show, however, a world full of robots did seem to be on the cards. What I thought was interesting about the concept is that it forced human beings to examine their beliefs and attitudes, particularly in a social way. The robot raised some intriguing questions, so you had a kind of reversal of roles. The robot student became the teacher. Harold Livingston speculated Haven could take on increasingly human traits and foibles. It would eventually have posed big problems for Cleaver. As I recall, I wrote several lines for Cleaver to say, he's like a son to me. I'm very grateful to know that someone appreciated the show. I truly believe we got a raw deal by ABC not continuing us. Yes, the theme of the robot student becoming the teacher reflects the theme of Ellison and Bova's Brillo story. These themes are further explored in more recent series, such as the Battlestar Galactica reimagining, AMC's Humans, and the Russian series Better Than Us, currently on Netflix. Will artificial intelligence, whether in robot form or not, one day gain sentience, an attempt to rise up out of a perceived enslavement? If so, by that time, we may be little match for them. Recall the chilling threat uttered in 1921's Rossum's Universal Robots. You are not as strong as the robots. You are not as skillful as the robots. The robots can do everything. You only give orders. You do nothing but talk. I don't want a master. I want to be master. Upcoming episodes of Forgotten TV.
fall. Richie and his friends were just four normal kids until they built a supercomputer they used to solve crimes with the help of a friendly reporter. Now, things will never be the same for the Whiz Kids. Coming this fall on CBS Wednesdays. Podcasts on Kolchak the Night Stalker, Whiz Kids, V the Series, and more. Interviews with show creators and cast. Stay tuned to find out how you can support Forgotten TV. Want more Forgotten TV? Become a patron on Patreon and gain access to Forgotten TV Supplemental, additional podcasts that go beyond the material presented in the show, plus extended previews of podcasts before they're openly posted, podcast swag, and more. For as little as a dollar a month, you can help produce Forgotten TV. The link to join us over on Patreon is in the show notes. Your funds make a difference, helping me pay for accounts needed to contact TV creators and talent. This episode of Forgotten TV was executive produced by Will Welton and Doc Pinko, with producers Eric Fusco, Rich Kunkel, and Ron. Also, thanks to all who support at the $1 and $2 levels. Forgotten TV is not affiliated with or authorized by ABC, NBC, Paramount Television, The Colzean Corporation, Tovern Productions, Mill Creek Entertainment, or any production company involved in the making of any TV show or film mentioned in this podcast. Links to Amazon are affiliate. All mentioned series and associated characters are the property of the respective copyright holders, and no infringement is intended. Audio clips are included for the purposes of review, commentary, and criticism only, and are not intended to infringe. The music track Etheric Echoes by Dream State Logic is used with permission and is licensed under an attribution, non-commercial, share-alike, 3.0, unported license. And I'd like to thank the following YouTube channels for making the audio clips possible. Movie Clips, Jamie Kennedy, Chuck Collins, KJM2672, Sean MC, Rob at C2009, Foy Wonder, JNA Nation. Sources of quotes and background information are from the books and articles Science Fiction Television Series 1959 to 1989 by Mark Phillips and Frank Garcia, TV Party by Billy Ingram, Starlog Magazine Issue 6, Lost in Mongolia Travels in Hollywood and Other Foreign Lands by Tad Friend, The Evolution of Artificial Life in Science Fiction by Joel Renstrom, Vintage Newspaper Articles and the websites The Terminator Files and The Retroist. Don't forget to like Forgotten TV on Facebook and follow it on Twitter. Visit Forgotten.tv for all content and links. This podcast is written, produced, and hosted by Chris Cooling, and this has been Forgotten TV. Forgotten TV.